hear God's call to worship with him. Psalm 86. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. For you are great and do wondrous things. You alone are God. Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your steadfast love toward me. You have delivered my soul from the depths of Sheol. This morning, Mr. Joseph Wagner will lead us in our opening hymn. Our first hymn this morning, number 132, Wondrous King, All Glorious, number 132, and we'll stand to sing.
We pray, O oh God, that this day your spirit would be upon us, that you would lift us to your heavenly courts and bless us as we look upon our glorious Savior. We pray that you would renew us in his image, that we might be to his glory and praise. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please remain standing and will confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God our Father our Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen.
glory forever. Amen. Give us water to drink. 
And Moses said to them, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water. The people grumbled against Moses and said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt? To kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass on before the people, taking with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock at Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water shall come out of it, and the people will drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Let's pray. Father, as we look to your word this morning, we thank you that we have in Jesus the one who interprets the scriptures for us. We pray that your spirit would lead us to an understanding of the truths of the gospel proclaimed here. We pray that you would minister to the needs of each heart this day, that we would be strengthened by grace to love, serve you in the world today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. This week has been a rather odd week when you look at the news reports that we've seen. Uh, one story earlier in the week was of a woman who traveled from Connecticut came to Washington, D.C., drove her car into one of the gates, tried to force her way through the gate by the White House, was stopped at the gate and then turned and ran through a high-speed chase until ultimately she ended up being shot by the police and killed, leaving her baby who was in the car with her at the same time. What was going on in her head? What was she thinking about? Later in the week, we hear the story of a man who gets out in the middle of the Washington Mall, stands out in front of the, everyone. There's even a report of somebody being there with a tripod camera to record it. But he douses himself with gasoline and lights himself on fire. He murders himself. Suicide. People came running towards him. Runners and joggers came by. They took their shirts off and tried to take the fire out, but it was too late. People are in distress. Many pressures bear on us in the course of life. And sometimes we take actions which are not very reasonable, not well thought through, but they express the, the pain that's within the heart, the agony that's being experienced. We don't know the circumstances of these two individuals too much. One woman was a dental hygienist who apparently was recently let go of her job, single mother of a child. It's uh, hard to hear stories like this when your heart goes out to people who are in situations like that. How can we change things so that they can be safe from those kinds of activities? The people of Israel were wandering out in the wilderness and Moses had led them out of Egypt. They come through to Mount Sinai, um, in the region of Mount Sinai, and there of course it's a wilderness area without much in the way of water. At the Lord's direction they come to this area near Rephidim, where there was a promise perhaps of some water, but apparently that promise was unmet. There was no water there. And so they got very frustrated and upset with Moses. You can understand the, you know, what's going on through the minds. You, you brought us out of Egypt? Fine, that's well and good. You spared us from Pharaoh and his great armies? That's great. How about giving us a drink of water? Have you brought us out here to die? And so they are very upset with Moses at this moment. And upset with God. Is God really among us? Will he really help us? In this time of our need, maybe you've been placed in situations like that. 
Not that you're without thirst, but you are missing something that is vital to you, something that's important. Jobs not turning out the way you hoped. A relationship is breaking down. All kinds of things may be developing in your life where you are at your, the end of your road. Is God really with me? Why has He put me through these kinds of experiences? I'm trying to be faithful to Him. I'm doing what He tells me to do. And look at what's happening. What are we to make of that? The last few weeks we've been talking about the importance of having basic rules for understanding the Scriptures. Rules that help us understand what it is that God intends to say to us from the Scriptures so that we do not uh, just walk into the Scriptures and, and take away something that has nothing really to do with the intention of the text. And so we're coming to this text here, which uh, I'm going to use as an example of one that's a little bit difficult to figure out. It's not the most difficult one that you could find in the Old Testament, but it will illustrate the importance of the three rules that we've been developing in the past three weeks. One, Scripture is its own interpreter. If you wish to understand the meaning of one particular text of Scripture, then the way to do that is to see it in the light of the whole testimony of Scripture. Scripture is its own interpreter. We don't rely on necessarily on creeds, church councils. We don't rely on pastors. Scripture is the final authority, and it interprets for us its own message. Second, Scripture reveals itself progressively. The work of redemption develops from seed form and unfolds over time until you come into the New Testament where it comes to full fruition. You see the, the very seed elements of the Gospel in the Old Testament, and they work themselves out until you can see them in full measure in the New Testament. And so we use that maxim introduced by St. Augustine, the new is in the old concealed, and the old is in the new revealed. So if you look to the Old Testament, you'll see the seed elements of the New Testament within it. And we'll look at that here in this Exodus chapter 17. And you see that develop over time until the New Testament reveals all that was hidden in the Old Testament. And finally, all of Scripture is to be understood in the light of the sufferings and glory of Christ, our Savior. Jesus Christ is the center of God's work of redemption and revelation. If you are to go through the pages of Scripture and understand its message, then you must understand it in the light of what God has to say about Jesus Christ. And if you try to interpret the Scriptures apart from the sufferings and glory of Christ, then you will surely misunderstand. You will surely miss the main point of the text. You may get some small points along the way, but you'll miss the main point. And nothing holds together apart from being connected with that center, Jesus Christ. So we look at Exodus chapter 17 where God leads His people through the wilderness. They come to this area called Rephidim where they're anticipating finding springs of water. But there were no springs. It was dry. And the people thirsted. Now, that much we understand. That's fairly clear. Uh, the one thing that we can look at in this story is that it is a, a, a dominant story, actually, in the pages of Scripture. It is a story that is referred to time and time again in both the Old and New Testaments. So it must have some significance for us today. Uh, you find a similar story in Numbers chapter 20 which occurs towards the end of Israel's wilderness wanderings. In Numbers chapter 20, it's almost the same identical story. Some slight differences between the two accounts. In the one story, Moses uh, strikes the rock uh, in, in front of the elders of Israel. In the second story, Moses is to speak to the rock without the elders being necessarily present. And in both cases, from the rock comes a spring of water. Very similar stories. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then you get into the Psalms, this testing of the Lord by the people, this questioning of His presence among them, occurs throughout the Psalms, particularly in Psalm 95, which begins 
rejoicing in God, God who is our rock, and then concludes with this warning, don't be like the people at Massa and Meribah who grumbled and complained about the Lord, who questioned His presence among them. Don't be like that. So there were continuing lessons to be learned for the people of God throughout the Old Covenant history. In the days of David and Solomon thereafter, they too needed to be reminded that they should not grumble or complain about God, but trust in His provision for them. In Ezekiel chapter 20, the prophet uses the story of God's judgment upon the wilderness community here, his sentencing them to die in the wilderness because of their sin, he uses that as a warning against the uh, exilic community. They must trust in the Lord and not uh, uh, grumble or complain about God's provision for them. Clearly, an important theme which finally gets picked up as we saw in our study in the book of Hebrews in chapters 3 and 4, where the writer to the Hebrews addresses the Jewish Christians of his day. Following the death and resurrection of Christ, he warns them about going back to their old Jewish religion and abandoning faith in Christ. And he says, don't be like that generation long ago at Massa and Meribah who quarreled about uh, God's provision for them and questioned whether God was with them. He said to the Jewish Christians, you need to remain true to Christ. Trust in Him and His provision. Yes, you are experiencing need at this time. Yes, you are experiencing loss at this time. But trust in Christ because you have greater riches with Christ than by going back to your old ways. So the story is a powerful story in the history of God's people and it reminds us first of the danger of grumbling against God, of unbelief, of looking at your circumstances and saying, things are not the way I expected them to be, therefore God is not with me. And God cannot provide for me. That does not follow. God uses circumstances in our lives to test us to test whether we will trust Him or not. And the one who was really being tested here was not God as to whether He would provide, but the people as to whether they would trust in God and His provision. And they demonstrated by the grumbling and complaining and the readiness to attack Moses, they really did not believe in the Lord. They were not trusting in Him. So God uses the circumstances of life to test our faith. Do you truly believe in God? Do you truly believe that He will be your provision, your salvation? When you see the money running out, when you see problems in the family, when you see gloom and doom in the marketplace, do you trust that God will somehow take care of you? He will provide. Circumstances in life will test you to see whether you truly believe or not. So it's a prominent story in the scriptures that warns us against unbelief, the dangers of uh, making a wrong conclusion with regard to our circumstances and rebelling against God because of it. But look at God's gracious provision for these people. It's an amazing story. And many interpreters miss what is said here. Moses turns to the Lord and cries out to him as he ought. He seeks God's wisdom. What shall I do? These people are about to stone me. Moses is the, is the one who's got his neck on the line here. And to mimic the words of John Bader, this is not a game. <laughs> this was serious business. You know, when you're out in the wilderness, you, you dehydrate rather quickly. And when there's no water in sight, you get quite desperate. So Moses brings this before the Lord, and that's what these people should have done. That's what we need to do in the midst of our desperate circumstances. Turn to the Lord and pray for His provision. Seek wisdom from God. 
that we might know how to respond. And God graciously provides Moses and the people of Israel with his word of provision. It's an amazing story here. Again, many commentators miss the significance of this. Moses is told by the Lord to gather the elders of Israel and walk in front of them to a rock that God would show him. There at that rock, God would stand on the rock. Nobody would see it, but Moses would see it. Moses would know God is here. Then God instructs Moses to take that staff, that very same staff that he led Israel out of Egypt, by which he struck the river Nile, by which he opened the waters of the Red Sea. That very staff, Moses is to take and he's to strike that rock. God will provide water for his people. Commentators look at this and they're not quite sure what to do with it. Some say, well, this is a story about the, the miraculous power of God to make provision for His people in the wilderness. True. God is the Lord of the heavens and the earth, and He can provide water in the midst of the wilderness. Indeed, He promises to transform the wilderness and make it flow with rivers of water by His grace. God is powerful, yes. Some modern commentators who are skeptical with regard to divine authorship of the Scriptures and deny the inerrancy of Scripture come to the text like this and say, well, we need to explain it on naturalistic terms. And Casuto is one of those who look at this text and say, well, what you have here is Moses comes up upon the rock, and the rock happened to be a bit of a thin crust of rock, and when he struck it with his rod, zowie, water came out. Now, that's pretty wild, don't you think? I mean, what was the last time you went into your backyard, dug a hole, and up came a, a, a river of oil? Come to Beverly Hillbillies. I think you have to be one of the Beverly Hillbillies to believe that kind of notion. Really? Moses just wanders out in the wilderness, picks a rock, hits it with a staff with everybody watching him, and wow, water comes out of it. Come on. The modernist notion is ridiculous. The way that it approaches Scripture. We've got to sweep those kind of, kinds of things aside. And listen to what the text says. Pay attention to it. We'll understand it in the light of, of what it intends to say. And then see how it's interpreted in the course of Scripture as well. And you'll see that it has a great richness to it. A glory. A wonder. A gospel to it. That addresses our deepest needs. The need of this people was not so much that they were thirsty and they needed water to drink. The need was their heart. They were thirsty for salvation. They didn't realize it. Didn't know it. Don't understand it. All they see is, I'm thirsty and I need water. But God uses this as an opportunity to teach them how desperate their circumstances are apart from His work of grace. That's the way it is with the people of our generation today. Thirsty. Looking for something. But always looking on the materialistic world. What can I get out of life? What can I get out of entertainment? What can I get out of fame and fortune? What can I get from money? From pleasure? All these kinds of things. It does not satisfy. And one will always be thirsty. It's only by the grace of God that people are not like that gentleman out on the Washington Mall, ending life. We are thirsty. But sometimes God has to shake us to make us see just how thirsty we are and just how desperate our circumstances are. Because apart from His gracious provision, we will perish. Those people had no resources in and of themselves to satisfy their thirst. They were at a loss. They were going to die in that wilderness except God spared them and saved them. God graciously provides for them. He preaches the gospel to them. 
Their deepest need is a need for the gospel, and that's exactly what Moses does, or God does through Moses at this time. Think of what God instructed Moses to do. First, the word for Meribah in the Hebrew has as its root, reeve, which is the Hebrew word for trial. And this whole situation is something of a test or a trial. There's a legal formality to all that's taking place here. Moses has the elders. Together they march over to this rock. There's a question. Will God provide for His people? Is God present with us or not? There's a judicial sanction. Moses strikes the rock. What is happening here? The key to it is when God says that I will be on that rock. The Lord Himself stands on that rock. And Moses in striking the rock is in effect striking the Lord. Why? Because the Lord failed? Because the Lord sinned? Because He was insufficient for His people? No. The Lord stood on that rock to bear the sins of His people. I am your salvation. The solution to your thirst is in me. And suffering the penalty for your sin, which brought you into this situation. The reason why you thirst is because of your sin. Because of your rebellion against God. And except that is addressed, can't be helped. God stood on that rock for his people, and Moses struck the rock, and so doing struck the Christ who would bear the sins of his people. And when Moses struck the rock in that judicial fashion, the rock opened and waters came out, bringing refreshment life to the whole congregation. The rock was Christ. Now, we see that first just in looking at the text itself that God Himself, the Lord, Yahweh, is the one who stood there on that rock and received the blow from Moses' rod. But then further, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament says, the rock that followed Israel around in the wilderness, the rock that provided water for Israel in the wilderness was Christ. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 4. Paul reflects on the experience of Israel in the wilderness and says the rock was Christ. God was in this moment revealing what He would have to do for His people. He would have to pay the penalty for their sin so that they might find refreshment salvation, life. Christ is that rock. And so when Pontius Pilate had his soldiers take Jesus after the trial and flog him and then take him to the cross and nail him on that cross, he died there for our sin as our sin bearer. Not because he himself had sinned, but because we had sinned. And he stands there for us. And when that soldier thrust that spear into his side, and from the side flowed blood and water, as the Apostle John says, we see here the fulfillment of what, of what was anticipated in Exodus 17. Water from the rock. Remember Jesus said in the Gospel of John, If any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. And from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus is the one through whom the water of life comes. Salvation comes through him and his death on the cross. And if you wish to have life, it's through Christ. He is the rock of our salvation. Do you believe in this rock? 
When we come to this text of Scripture, the Scriptures point us to Jesus. He is the one who fulfills this message for us. And so whenever we come to the text, we have to come and see it in Jesus and what God reveals to us of the Christ. And it's only in Christ that we can begin to interpret and see how this applies to me. Do I thirst? I must come to Christ. That's God's provision for me. There's no other hope apart from Him. Do I thirst in the ordinary things of life? Every experience that I have of life of any good thing must come to me through the sufferings and glory of the Christ. His death for me, His mediation, is the reason why I enjoy food and drink. The reason why I enjoy a family, friends, and loved ones. The reason why I enjoy life in this world. Everything comes through Christ and His mediation. It's because He was struck that you are healed. It's because He was wounded that you have life. And every little bit of life, every time you wake up in the morning, that's because Christ died on the cross. History continues only because Christ died on the cross. God's gracious provision is for us here. So this transforms the way you look at your life. My job, my food, everything. It all comes to me through Jesus Christ. He is the rock of our salvation. You need to orient your life around Him. And trust in Him. It's right. Father, we pray that your spirit would bless this message to our hearts, that we who are united to Christ would see the glory of your work for us, that we would be moved by your great compassion, that you would stand on the rock for us and take the stroke of justice in our place, that we might receive the refreshing waters of salvation. We pray, O oh Lord, for your blessing on us, that we would know that salvation and all its joys and all its treasures and blessings. And we ask that you would strengthen us that we might live for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's respond to the ministry of God's word by breaking before the Lord our morning tithes.
that you would bless them to your glory and praise, and that you would advance your kingdom throughout the earth. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your seats. Let's turn to the Lord this time and confess to Him in our sins. Let's pray. We thank you, O oh Father, for your gracious provision for us. We thank you for such a Savior who would enter this world and suffer and die for us. We thank you that he bore the stroke of justice in our place so that we will be set free and might have life eternal. We pray that you forgive us for our many sins as we continue to fall far short of your holiness and your righteousness and your perfection. We pray, O oh God, that you would cleanse us of every sin or sins against you and against each other. We pray that you would strengthen us by your grace that we might live more perfectly before you. We pray for the outpouring of your spirit on each of us that we might live for your glory and praise. Forgive us for all our sins. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The Lord promises to forgive these, forgive us of our sins in these words from the prophet Isaiah. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. Christ instituted the Lord's Supper as an ordinance to be observed by His church until He comes again. It is not a re-sacrificing of Christ, but is a remembrance of the once for all sacrifice of Himself and His death for our sins. Nor is it a mere memorial to Christ's sacrifice. It is a means of grace by which God feeds us with the crucified, resurrected, exalted Christ does so by His Holy Spirit and through faith. Thus He strengthens us in our warfare against sin and in our endeavors to serve Him in holiness. The sacrament further signifies and seals the forgiveness of our sin and our nourishment and growth in Christ. The bread and wine represent the crucified body and shed blood of the Savior which He gave for His people. In this sacrament, God confirms that He is faithful and true to fulfill the promises of His covenant. And He calls us to deeper gratitude for our salvation, to renewed consecration, and to more faithful obedience. The Supper is also a bond and pledge of the communion that believers have with Him and with each other as members of His body. As the Scripture says, for we, being many, are one bread and one body, for we are all partakers of that one bread. The supper anticipates the consummation of the ages when Christ returns to gather all His redeemed people at the glorious wedding feast of the Lamb. As we come to the Lord's table, we humbly resolve to deny ourselves, to crucify the sin that is within us, to resist the devil, and to follow Christ as it becomes those who bear His name. It is my privilege as a minister of Christ to invite all who are right with God and His church through faith in the Lord Jesus to come to the Lord's table. If you have received Christ and are resting upon Him alone for salvation as He is offered to you in the Gospel, and if you live penitently and seek to walk in godliness before the Lord, then this supper is for you. And I invite you in Christ's name to eat the bread and drink the cup. At the same time, God's word says, Whoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. 
beloved congregation, lift up your hearts from these visible elements, even to heaven itself, where Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of the Father, from where we look for him to return and perfect our redemption. All the promises of God are yes and amen in him. Every spiritual blessing is found in him. With joyful hearts in Christian love, partake of his table, giving thanks for the great love he has shown to us. Let's pray. Father, as we come before this table this, this morning, we pray that your spirit would bless our hearts, that we would receive this sacrament in faith, that we would rest in your provision of salvation in Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death on the cross for us. We thank you for this bread and cup, which uh, show forth his death for us. And we pray, O oh God, that as we take part in these elements, that your blessing will be on the bread and cup, that you strengthen us by faith, and we pray that we be encouraged by your spirit, by the ministry of your grace, by this sacrament, that we might live more godly, more faithful before you, living in hope of the great day of salvation that is yet to come, the great supper of the Lamb that is yet to come. So we pray for your blessing on this meal. We ask for your blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples as I am ministering in his name, give this bread to you. Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me.
same manner our Savior took the cup and having given thanks as has been done in His name, He gave it to His disciples as I, ministering in His name, give this cup to you.
technically providing for all of our needs. We pray, O oh God, that you would look upon this congregation gathered here this morning. We pray that according to your grace and your love, you would minister to each heart. Strengthen each one by grace through faith. May they look to Jesus for all things. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would deliver us from evil and from the evil one. Uh, prosper us in our work in your kingdom and your world today. Help us to advance <coughs> your kingdom in every area of life. We pray for your blessing on those who serve in a variety of places. We thank you for our home mission efforts. Lord, we just pray that you would uphold and strengthen uh, these many different attempts to establish churches. Uh, we pray for Stephen Payson in Wittenberg, Pennsylvania. We thank you for the great things you are doing there. Seven communicant members are being added, uh, and the two men that are being baptized. We thank you for your uh, great work of salvation there. We pray that you continue to bless that church. We pray for our church in Germantown under Bill Snodgrass's ministry. We pray that you would prosper that work and advance it. We uh, pray that you would gather students and, and mature Christian believers to that congregation that it might be established and be a strong once more. We pray for the advance of your kingdom and, and distant blessings on our country. We pray that we would sustain it. Bless those who uh, do that which is right and good. We pray, Lord, that you would suppress the wicked and the evil in high places and in low. We pray, O Lord, that you would advance your kingdom in our country. Bless the preaching of the gospel in many different churches around the country, bless the preaching of your word in radio and TV ministries and all across the internet as well. We pray that Christ would be exalted and your people build up. We ask for your blessings on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Our final one today, number 505, all the way my Savior leads me. Number five. And we'll stand the same.